In 206 BC, Zhang Yu led his army to enter Zhang Yong and burnt Zhang Yong Palace to the ground, with the burning lasting for three months. Additionally, he buried alive the surrendered Qin soldiers after the Battle of Julu, thus provoking social grievances throughout the land. In early 205 BC, Cheng Yu personally led his massive army to conquer the region of Qi. However, once he arrived there, he got mired in trouble. Cheng Yu defeated Tian Rong, who was immediately killed by the people of Qi. However, Cheng Yu once again employed brutal means to massacre all the residents of a captured city to display his strength. The unyielding Qi people were enraged. Tian Rong's younger brother, Tian Heng, summoned tens of thousands of Tian Rong's former followers and launched guerrilla warfare against Cheng Yu. This war lasted several months, and the Chu army was trapped in the region of Qi without being able to move. However, in the west, a powerful opponent of Cheng Yu was on the rise. After conquering Guanzong, Liu Bong did a number of things. First, he took control of the commanderies of Longxi and Bedi, while sending troops to defend the Shunu people in the north. Second, he dispatched the Han army to march into Henan, Hedong, and Hene, summoned several vassal kings to surrender, and cleared the obstacles on the route of his future eastward expedition. And third, he implemented moderate policies in Guangzhou, exempting people's corvée and encouraging agriculture while suppressing trade and business. He opened the Qin Dynasty's imperial gardens, parks, and pools to the common people to bring under cultivation and also reduce taxes. With this policy of recuperation and rehabilitation, the war-ravaged Guangzhou region had its vitality restored. The crops grew, and the population gradually stabilized. And Liu Bong also had a greater goal. Sire, King Sheng is currently leading his troops to battle in the region of Qi. With this capital, Pencheng, being left undefended, it's true. And we could join forces with other vassal kings to march eastwards, capture Pencheng. Precisely what I intend. But I wouldn't recommend this course of action. Attacking Pencheng would be risky. After Sheng Yu entered Yinyang, his counselor advised him to crown himself emperor. However, Sheng Yu insisted on returning to Pencheng, which is situated on a wide expanse of flat land. And he said, Not returning home after becoming rich and powerful is like wearing fine clothing without anyone seeing him. He later even killed this counselor. Yes, it's true. But sire, do you not know why Sheng Yu is not afraid of the other vassal kings occupying the central plains? Because he has no vision. And that is why he will not remain in power much longer. Sheng Yu is indeed short-sighted. There is good reason for him to feel secure and fear nothing. Is that a fact? He must inform me. Sire, think about what we lack most in our own army. You're talking about? Cavalry. At the end of the Qin Dynasty and the early days of the Han Dynasty, the troops of the land combat operations were divided into infantry, chariot soldiers, and cavalry. 
The infantry was the main body of the army, and the infantry soldiers were known as the brave warriors in the Han Dynasty. The chariot soldiers were in charge of driving the chariots, which were four horse-drawn wooden chariots equipped with spears, crossbows, shields, and other offensive and defensive weaponry. One chariot would also have three heavily armored chariot soldiers riding on it. The chariots would be responsible for assaulting the enemy positions and disrupting the enemy's battle formations. On defense, the chariots would be used as barriers blocking the enemy attacks. However, due to their low flexibility in combat and costly construction, their replacement was the mobile and flexible cavalry. In the early Han Dynasty, cavalry was divided into light cavalry and heavy cavalry. Light cavalrymen wore no armor and used bows and crossbows as their main weapons. Light cavalry was mainly used for long-range raids. Heavy cavalrymen wore armor were armed with spears and responsible for charging forward into enemy positions. In the Cold Weapons era, the cavalry's importance to a battle was tantamount to that of modern day tanks. In its long years of fighting Qirong, the barbarians, and the Chengnu people, Qin Dynasty developed the best cavalry of the time period. When Cheng Yu defeated the Qin army in the Battle of Julu, he accepted Chang Han's surrender, and his troop size increased from 50,000 to 400,000. Among them were these elite cavalrymen. I know what you mean, my general. But in order to achieve supremacy, how could I be overcautious? Moreover, I have conquered the former three Qin generals. Guazhang is stable, and Xiao Yu is busy dealing with his own problems. I maintain this is an excellent opportunity that should not be delayed. If you insist on waging this war, I know of a way. Ten days ago, the number of horses reported to Prime Minister Xiao has increased 10,000. I can build our cavalry, but I will need some time. Good. So, great general. Go build our cavalry. Meanwhile, I will lead our army personally to attack Peng Chong. Yes, Highness. Liu Bang couldn't wait to replace Cheng Yu as the hegemon king. The time was ripe to redivide the country. In April 205 BC, Liu Bang joined forces with five vassal kings and assembled a coalition army of 560,000 troops to launch an attack on Pen Chen. To justify the war he was waging, Liu Bang accused Cheng Yu of murdering Cheng Xin, Emperor Yi of Chu, who was once the monarch in name. During his eastward expedition, Liu Bang held a memorial for the late emperor. According to the historical books, Liu Bang exposed his left arm, cried loudly, and went into mourning for three days. During this time, what was Han Xin doing? 
Why didn't Liu Bang let his general-in-chief lead the attack on Peng Shen? The historical books didn't record the answers to these questions. We can only find clues from some of the historical records.